My name is Alexander Impolsky. I'm a CEO of Security Scorecard, the leading security rating platform in the world. In this video series called Security DNA, I'm going to talk to people from all walks of life, board members, CIOs, CISOs, industry innovators, about what cybersecurity means to them and the latest trends. Welcome. Welcome to Security DNA. So with me today is Alan Gannett. Alan's mission is to help people realize and live up to their potential. He believes creativity is accessible to all, but most people just don't have the right tools. He actually wrote a book called The Creative Curve that shows how the creative people and how creative process can be learned by anybody. He co-founded and served as a CEO of TrackMaven, a marketing analytics platform that large brands like GE and NBA and many other high growth startups have been using. And uh, in 2018, TrackMaven merged with uh, Skyward. So Alan, uh, pleasure to have you here and congrats on all of your success. Thanks, man. Congrats on all of yours. I'm excited to chat with you. So I got a couple of questions for you and I'm very excited about this because you are, you are the de facto authority and creativity. So maybe I'll learn a thing or two. <laughs> um, so the first question is, um, in your book, you talk about the four laws of uh, creativity, uh, consumption, imitation, creative communities, and iteration. So if you mm -hmm. were to think of a cybersecurity industry and ways in which it needs to always be creative to stay ahead of bad actors, which law do you think applies the most and, uh, and why? Well, I think... Maybe the law that applies the most interesting way to me when it comes to cybersecurity be the community aspect. Because I think when I think you think about very technical solutions, oftentimes we don't think about the human component, but whether it's software that's being built by humans, whether that's some of these sort of like network threat intelligence type tools and technologies that are out there, I think inherently almost like any industry, the community aspect of it's really important. And so I would generally encourage people who work in cybersecurity to remember that even though it's technical, even though it's engineering driven, it's still at the end of the day, a very people driven industry and people driven function. And you have to interact with people, which is obviously hard right now because of COVID, but you have to find those moments to meet people, to work together, find ways that you can collaborate. So um, as you know, the cybersecurity industry remains one of the most innovative ecosystems on the planet. There's just so much innovation. Why do you think that is? And why do most people believe that creative success comes down to having an aha light bulb moment? Yeah. That it's reserved for certain geniuses. Like, why is it that there's such a perception? Yeah. So I'll answer, I'll answer the first question, which is that, you know, I think in, in general, whenever there are constraints, what you find is that creativity goes up. So creativity actually works really well with constraints. We see this in like little funny ways, like think about Twitter with their character limits or memes that have sort of clear constraints, but also with movies and music, there's sort of structures and formulas to what kind of movies and plots people actually react to and respond to. And so in your industry, what you have is this constraint of you have this always on threat that people are trying to innovate with. And so I think that pressure, that way of thinking, that understanding allows you to create a lot of innovation because you have this sort of focused area in which you can focus. Now, your second question around aha modes, I think it's kind of really comes down to a lot of this sort of marketing of creativity, which is when you watch movies, when you read sort of PR reports and magazine profiles of great creatives, where you're really you know, imbibing is the sort of the, the version of creativity that people want you to read, right? It's like, if you work in comms at Apple, you want people to think about Steve Jobs in a certain way. The issue is that that is not actually how creativity works. So in the book, I basically, the first half of the book is sort of myth busting a lot of the ideas around creativity. And the second half is I interviewed 25 living creative greats, so billionaires, Oscar winners, Michelin star chefs about their creative practices. What you find over and over and over again is when you look at the actual science behind creativity, what we know is that aha moments, flashes of genius are a pretty normal biological process that come from consuming lots of information about your vertical and giving yourself time to properly work through those ideas in your right hemisphere. And there's a whole bunch of things we can go into, but like the sort of the long and the short of it is that ultimately we have a vision of creativity 
that we've been sold with because it drove us to watch movies, to buy products, to do these things. That doesn't mean it's actually how creativity works. Super interesting. So the third question is, uh, you've talked about how many of the world's most creative minds wholeheartedly embraced imitation uh, as part of the approach to commercial success. Uh, so what's the right way of imitating the work of others in a field when you're trying to innovate? Yeah, so one of the interesting things with creativity is we think it's all about radical novelty. It's all about newness. But actually, if you look at the products that have been most successful, that's not the case, right? Like, look at the iPad. The iPad is an iPhone without a phone. The iPhone is an iPod with a phone. The iPod was a better MP3, but, right? Like, it's actually much more incremental and iterative. And if you look at movies, for example, you find that imitation is hugely important. Think about Star Wars. It's literally a Western in space, right? And so one of the things that we don't understand is that the ideas that tend to take off in creative fields are actually ideas that have one foot in the familiar and one foot in the novel. They're familiar enough to be interesting and comfortable, but novel enough to drive entry. And I talk about the science of why this is in the book. But fundamentally, the thing then for you to understand is that your job as a creative is not to create the most radical thing ever, but to take something that has an existing framework and add your own twist to it. So this is why imitation can be very useful. Think about uh, in startups, we have metaphors, right? Uber for X, Airbnb for X. And so I really like using the term metaphor because I think if you apply that to any creative project you're doing, it's a really easy way to imitate without plagiarizing, which is to sort of be inspired by the structure of something else, but adding your own novel and fresh perspective to it. Super interesting. I like the metaphor um, <laughs> as an example. So a major challenge um, with determining originality that many people face is, uh, especially in technology and cybersecurity, <laughs> is the abundance of what we think are original ideas. Mm. So everybody can come up with an original idea, or at least you know think that they came up with an original idea, but the idea could suck. <laughs> is that a creative idea? How does one go about figuring out if this is actually a great creative idea that could be commercialized? Like, how do you actually go about figuring this out? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the big mistakes we have when it comes to sort of understanding creativity is we mistake creativity for productivity right? So creativity is not the same as productivity. Productivity is doing something. Creativity is doing the right thing at the right time. And you, know, you could paint an exact replica of the Mona Lisa today, and it might be productive. It might be technically proficient, but it's not creative. It's not the right idea at the right time. And so ultimately what you have to do is if you're in any creative task, you have to understand where would an idea fall within your audience's perceptions? How familiar novel is it? Is it too familiar, right? Is it an exact replica of something that's existed before? Is it too novel and going to turn people off and freak them out? And so one of the easiest ways to do this, and you see this with um, CPG companies, is to use data as part of your innovation process. So we have this image of creative sort of like going off and like creating something and like never taking an outside input. But in reality, if you look at CPG companies, hugely data-driven. If you look at most musicians, they go through countless iterations of their music. Think about movies, they have preview audiences and test audiences. And so what you find is that whether it's qualitative or quantitative, great creatives across fields find ways to bring their audience into their innovation process and better understand where their idea is going to fall on that creative curve continuum. Super helpful. Thank you so much, Ellen, for all your insights. I'm confident that the viewers of a Security DNA uh, podcast are going to find them very useful and, mm -hmm. uh, and get to innovate more. So thank you for being with us. Thanks, man. Thanks, everyone. Bye.